This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here. What an incredible moment this week with the first ever firing of three Raptor engines on serial number eight. And the full stacking is now complete with the nose cone being lifted just recently. We are so close now to the 15 kilometer test flight. I simply cannot wait. Now we have some breaking news on Elon's Starship update presentation and loads more construction updates. And along with that, SpaceX had yet another successful Starlink launch during the week with the satellite constellation growing by a first. Further 60. Then of course we have Osiris Rex, the first US spacecraft to collect and attempt to return an asteroid regolith sample to Earth. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. After the aborted tests last week, SpaceX once again tried to spool up the three Raptor engines on Starship serial number eight, this time resulting in what seemed like a successful pre-burner and then static fire tests during the second night of testing. During the first testing window on the 18th, the pad was cleared and propellant loading began at 3.14 a.m. Engine chill started 15 minutes later, denoted by those three triangular vents on the side of the vehicle. Then for the first time during SN8's testing regime, the 10 minute siren was sounded at 3.34 a.m. This attempt, which we now believe to be a pre-burner test, was aborted at T0 at 3.43 a.m. Just a note there, this was the first time that we know of that three Raptor engines had been tested together. This even includes SpaceX's test center in McGregor, Texas, where Raptors are test fired individually and thus aborts are generally expected. Now, after around two hours, tank farm activity spooled up once again and those three engine vents opened at 5.49 a.m. The 10 minute siren then sounded a few minutes later and at 6.01 on October 19th, Starship SN8's trio of Raptor engines were unleashed, producing a large fireball indicative of a pre-burner ignition test. Now for those unfamiliar, a pre-burner is essentially a small engine that powers just the turbo pump and each Raptor engine has two, one for the liquid oxygen and one for the liquid methane. The vehicle was then depressurized and safed before workers returned to the pad. Meanwhile, not long after Starship SN8's first pre-burner test was completed, SpaceX teams rolled the reinforced five stack inside the low bay and stacked the first truly functional nose cone already outfitted with forward flaps near the top. This five stack has structural bracing or stringers on the inside as can be seen by these weld marks. To gain structural integrity, the lower half of the vessel can be pressurized, whereas this upper half needs a lot more bracing as it's not going to be pressurized. This segment here also needs to hold the weight of the nose cone and the header tank filled with liquid liquid oxygen, as well as the flaps, motors, and hinges. The entire stacked nose will also need to endure a great deal of force during the descent, and most critically, that crazy flip around maneuver. It is therefore imperative that this part of the vehicle is structurally sound for those immense forces. Now, in Mary's photo here, we can see that SpaceX is erecting the structure for a tent next to the orbital launch pad, which is quite interesting. SpaceX might have chosen to have a building this close to the launch pad for maintenance, storage, or just garage purposes. On Wednesday, we saw yet another test of Starship SN8. The road was closed at 9.35 p.m. and those three Raptor chill valves opened at 12.34 a.m. We then also saw venting out of the top of the vehicle, presumably out of the liquid oxygen downcomer pipe. This pipe can be seen in RGV aerial photography's photo here and will connect up to the liquid oxygen header tank that sits at the tip of the nose cone. Corey on Twitter, of course, published a great animation showing the plumbing of the liquid oxygen header tank and how it feeds from the tank to the Raptors. A link to that full video is in the description. During the second night of testing, SpaceX completed another pre-burner test at 1.21 a.m. on the 20th of October, this time producing a spectacular fireball noticeably larger than the one produced by the SN8's first pre-burner test. Is it possible that not all six of the Raptors pre-burners ignited during that first attempt, which is why they maybe had to try again? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Just a mere two hours hours later at 3.13 a.m. SpaceX fully ignited all three Raptor engines on serial number eight for the very first time. This was likely producing thrust equivalent to around 90% of a Falcon 9 booster for a brief moment. This is a crucial milestone for SN8. The vehicle completed and survived a three engine static fire and was left seemingly unscathed on its first attempt. After that static fire, of course, all backup road closure dates were canceled, pointing towards the successful test. And then Elon confirmed that saying that the data from three engine Starship static fire this morning looks good proceeding with nose cone mate. Now, while talking about the Raptor 
Raptor engines, I think it's important to include this stunning animation created by Kimi here showing the pitch, yaw, and roll control of the three Raptor engines. Each Raptor has around 15 degrees of gimbal ability without the bells intersecting, even in that crazy roll configuration. Moreover, those three vacuum-rated Raptors will be attached to Starship's hull and will not have any gimbal control at all. If you're not subscribed here to Kimi on YouTube and following on Twitter there, you are totally missing out. Also, a big thank you to you there watching as well for liking, subscribing, and commenting on these videos. I can't believe it, but it looks like we could hit a quarter of a million subscribers by January at this point, all because of you. You are amazing. Now, three new road closure windows were set for October 21st from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m., 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., and 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Shortly after, Mary posted this photo here of the new Lieber LR1600 crane on the roll lifts at the production facility. This crane has been undergoing assembly for the past couple of weeks, and it's got a maximum lift capability of around 600 tons and a max hoist height of 187 meters. The crane was moved to the pad during the first window with the intent to be used to stack SN8's nose cone on top of the tank section. Now this giant crane was assembled at the old gas well site in Boca Chica and it's speculated to be the place where SpaceX will erect a wind powered liquid oxygen plant to be able to produce the oxidizer for Starship on site. Elon mentioned this in the Tesla Battery Day event. This will be much cheaper and it will make the goal of frequent flights out of Boca Chica more realistic. As the nose cone awaited the move, Elon tweeted this close-up photo here as it sat inside the low bay. He also included this photo of the high bay, which is now almost complete. Austin Barnard also tweeted this photo here of the high bay, with Elon then replying that there will be a 360 degree glass star bar at the top of the high bay. After the crane was moved to the pad, the roll lifts were taken back to the production facility to pick up SN8's nose cone, which was then rolled out of the low bay at 4pm and slowly made its way to the pad, arriving at 5.30pm. Austin Barnard captured this stunning footage here of the nose cone rolling past him just metres away, showing that immense scale of this section of the vehicle. Just think that one day in the near future, 100 people could be sitting in a nose cone section just like this, awaiting their launch to the Red Planet. How crazy is that? Now, on the night of the 21st, the road was closed at 9.23pm, with the pad being cleared soon thereafter. It is believed that the liquid oxygen header tank in the tip of the nose cone underwent an ambient pressure test to verify that the nose cone was ready to be stacked onto the rest of the vehicle. Also, at 5.53am, we saw two RCS tests out of the nose cone. Just seven minutes later, we then spotted the venting out of the tip of the nose cone, indicating that the header tank was now being depressurized and that testing was over for the night. Around 10 minutes later, we saw workers return to the pad. And of course, the big news for the week. On Thursday evening, with a stunning sunset in the background, SN8 was fully stacked. What an amazing view this was, captured of course by the one and only Mary. It is hard to believe that it was over a year ago that we first saw a Starship stacked. This time, however, it isn't just a mock-up as seen with last year's Mark 1. Multiple prototypes and test tanks have brought us to the point where we are now, looking at a fully stacked and flight-worthy Starship vehicle. This time, SN8 will break free from the ground and reach for the sky in the upcoming weeks. A truly remarkable event this is. It has been inspiring to watch SpaceX iterate over the last year. This point in history is bringing our sci-fi dreams into reality of spaceflight today. These Starship vehicles will one day take the first humans to Mars, and this milestone brings us one step closer to that historical event that will change human life as we know it. Now, to news at the production facility, the nose cone that was moved next to SN5 has received a white paint job. Austin Barnard captured these photos here of the famous NASA worm logo on the side of the prototype nose cone. Is it possible that SpaceX will also paint SN5 white and then stack this nose on top to be used as a human landing system mock-up? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Now, interestingly, a recent photo here by Mary from NASA Spaceflight shows serial number 9 inside the mid-bay receiving its fin root structure. The aero covers will then be placed onto this structure ahead of flap attachment in the near future. SN10 has begun final assembly inside the mid bay, with the forward dome being stacked on top of the common dome and the section of the liquid oxygen tank seen in Brendan's diagram here. Furthermore, SN11's aft dome was stacked on top of the skirt on Thursday morning, and its forward dome was also sleeved during the week. 
From this, we can now assume that all forward domes are now sleeved with four ring stacks instead of the three seen on a Starship serial number three, four, five, six, eight, and nine. The one main advantage by sleeving forward domes with four ring stacks instead of three is that the fairing section can be four rings tall instead of five, and that way all of the welds can be done by the machines. The current five ring sections for SN8 and SN9's nose cones consists of a three and a two ring section manually welded together. To add to this, we have actually actually seen a four stack with stringers which is likely to be for SN10's nose cone. Something a little special this week to sum all of this up, what you're looking at is a graphic created by Brendan showing an overview of the current status of all of SpaceX's current prototypes. Serial number 8 with nose cone stacked and getting ready for flight. Serial number 9 awaiting flap installation and then cryo testing at the pad. Serial number 10 only needing stacking and serial number 11 and 12 currently in segment assembly. And finally there we've currently seen 6 segments of Super Heavy that has been spotted so far with with labels. So what is predicted to happen next? We've just today seen new road closure windows between 8am and 11pm on the 28th of October with a backup on the 29th and a shorter 6 hour window on the 30th. These are long daytime windows so it's possible that we could see SpaceX going for a second static fire and the 15 kilometer flight on the 28th or the 29th and then a shorter road closure window on the 30th to bring it back to the facility if it survives. Very exciting if that ends up being true. At the same time, some quite disappointing news. Toby on Twitter asked Elon if he could give us an update on the date for the Starship presentation, and Elon replied saying probably next week in form of a written piece on the SpaceX website. Instead though, we may actually get a tour presented with Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, quite soon with Elon replying to Tim saying that he is in Boca Chica every week, so maybe they could talk then. Given that Starship is not exactly subtle, this is more of of a design clarification to match what people can already see. So yes, hope to see something drop there very soon. Big thanks to Mary and the team at NASA Spaceflight capturing all of this stuff with the boots there on the ground. Likewise, Lab Padre with the 24-7 views and RGV aerial photography from above. We couldn't cover all of this progress without you. Now, a great start to the week with Starlink launch number 14 and the 18th mission for 2020. Glorious weather set the scene with Falcon 9 and the payload of 60 more Starlink satellites waiting at pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. The launch went without a hitch, quickly followed by main engine cutoff, stage separation and fairing jettison. Then we had the always enjoyable booster return visions and after entry burn and rapid descent, the first stage landed on the drone ship, of course I still love you. This marked the sixth successful landing for this particular booster and the 32nd landing on this particular drone ship. Now the fairings for this mission have each flown three times before and both were caught by the ships Miss Chief and Miss Tree. Now sadly the corner of the net ripped on Miss Tree resulting in a not so secure fairing as we see there. So after about 80 minutes into the mission we saw the tension rods release and another batch of 60 Starlink satellites were sent on their way. Always a great shot to see. Sadly, the next Starlink launch that was also due to fly this week was scrubbed due to the loss of an upper stage camera. As Elon Musk said, it was probably nothing serious, but standing down to re-examine the whole vehicle just in case. Now before jumping to the awesome news this week with Osiris Rex, I just wanted to show some amazing photos here by Greg Scott from October 20. Here we have the massive mobile launcher for the Artemis 1 mission on top of crawler transporter number 2. This huge beast was slowly moved up the ramp leading to launch pad 39B at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Just beautiful shots there provided to us here by Greg. Every time I see this thing it blows my mind. At around 400 feet or 121 meters tall, this monster will actually remain sitting here at the pad for two weeks while engineers perform a number of tasks. That includes a launch countdown timing test to ensure that the launch team's process is A-OK, -okay, and they are also going to be doing a top to bottom washdown of the mobile launcher to remove any debris remaining from the installation of the umbilical arms. Huge thanks there Greg, awesome work mate, head over to support him there on Twitter. 
Now some news I'm also super excited about this week, the OSIRIS-REx mission, which is of course planned to retrieve a sample of asteroid Bennu and return that sample to Earth in what will be a seven year odyssey. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but before that, a big thank you to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video. Now this amazing subscription streaming service provides thousands of award winning documentaries. Of course, if you're anything like me, the space related content will catch your eye immediately. This episode of Breakthrough talks about the Spitzer Telescope's groundbreaking discoveries of exoplanets that could be very similar to Earth. What will be our next big discoveries using the next generation of space telescopes? Could this technology allow us to more accurately test for extraterrestrial life? Well, this documentary called Is Anybody Out There takes a deep dive into just that. Nothing has revived that search as much as the recent discoveries of the many thousands of Earth-like planets where life could be possible. So should we reach out? Or should we perhaps hide? You can get a number of perspectives right there. I've been a subscriber to Curiosity Stream for a long time and I've loved so many documentaries and series offered here. If space content isn't your thing, perhaps you're interested in history, nature, food, travel, science and technology. There are many great libraries here for you to explore and you can even stream this incredible content worldwide anytime on a range of supported devices. If you would like to help support me and would like to check it out, give it a try by heading to curiositystream.com slash Marcus House. With that you can sign up for access at just $14.99 for the entire year. You'll find that link in the description below. So yes, this week Osiris Rex, which of course stands for Origin Spectral Interpretation Resource Identification Security Regolith Explorer, was launched from Cape Canaveral's Slick 41 on September the 8th, 2016, on top of an Atlas V. The Osiris Rex journey to Bennu took 27 months, and then it performed an Earth gravity assist a tad over a year later. In total, it took around two years and three months before the vessel arrived at Bennu. In early December 2018, mapping activities began, and continued for a further two years looking for an ideal spot to perform the touch and go part of the mission to obtain that sample. Ever so gently touching the asteroid for that sample. Kind of reminds me of boop. So yes, with the team having been surprised at just how rocky the surface of Bennu was, a site named Nightingale was selected. This was less than the width of a few car park spaces and a carefully choreographed slow approach resulted in the robotic arm touching the surface. The sampler head fired a burst of nitrogen gas to displace the dust and rock particles and then here is the historic moment where contact was announced and years of work has just paid off. Now it does appear that the spacecraft may have done its job a little too well because it's actually grabbed too much material with its robotic arm. This appears to have caused a lid jam of some sort which allowed some of the asteroid sample to escape. The team is currently working on the problem and hope to get enough sample safely stowed away in the return capsule. It's a wait for March 2021 and proper Earth alignment before the journey home begins. Arriving near Earth sometime around late September 2023, the capsule will re-enter the atmosphere before landing some 80 miles from Salt Lake City in Utah. The main body of OSIRIS-REx will continue on to a solar orbit. So yes, this sample return will provide invaluable data on the early formation of the solar system as well as other information including helping humanity to understand asteroids in general. There are plenty out there that could potentially impact Earth someday, so the more investment into this research, the safer we will all be. Now just quickly a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. The support that each and every one of you here provides allows us to increase the time that we can spend on the content and editing. Each and every one of you listed here is helping and we are investing the majority of that in the video production. As that list continues to grow we can do even more. So if you like what we do here on the channel and would like to join our awesome patrons head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. That gives you access to interact with us more directly via the linked roles on our Discord server. You can have earlier access to the videos to watch before any Anyone else, and you can also have your name listed right there like all of those other incredible people. Massive thank you as well to Brendan, Adam and Brenton in the production team helping out hugely with the videos along with our quality control squad here helping us to check over the videos before they go live. If you're interested in these topics and you'd like to be a part of this follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today we have our video last week giving you a rundown on Southern Launch in Australia, Starship and Crew 1 updates along with New Shepard and the next Falcon Heavy. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right content that YouTube has selected from a channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching as always and we'll see you all in the next video.